ladies and gentlemen. The show will begin in 10 minutes. We kindly ask you to avoid exiting and entering the auditorium while the speakers are speaking. Thank you and enjoy the show.
ladies. Ladies and gentlemen, the event is about to start. Please silence your cell phones and remain seated. Enjoy the show. Hello everyone and welcome to TEDx William & Mary 2020. TEDx is an independently organized TED event that aims to inspire the community and elevate local voices. Us, this past seven months, we along with an amazing student committee have been planning and organizing this event and this committee has chosen the theme, The Time Is Now, because we believe that there is no time like the present to make a difference and to share ideas worth spreading. We had an incredibly competitive pool of almost 70 speaker applicants this year, and after much deliberation and auditions, we are pleased to announce that we will have six speakers talking on a range of topics that are relevant to the William and Mary community. We could not talk about the time is now without addressing topics related to sustainability. Because of that, we use the green guides from developed by the William and Mary Sustainability Department to help us plan this event tonight. One of the examples of that is the bookmarks that you receive at the entrance. You can reuse it, keep it, and avoid us uh, wi having waste at our event tonight. We would like to say thank you very much to our sponsors. We have the Vice President's Office, the Student Leadership Development Office too. We have the Velocity Urgent Care Williamsburg and the Student Assembly. Please welcome to the stage the President and the Vice President of William Mary Student Assembly, Kelsey Vita and Ellie Thomas. Good evening. Yeah. Good evening and welcome. My name is Kelsey and this is my friend Ellie and we are so excited for tonight. TEDx is an incredible event that celebrates the power of ideas to change attitudes, lives, and the world. Student Assembly supports this event 
because we believe that members of our community have the incredible ability to make change. Last spring, Ellie and I ran on the idea that students are change makers and that together we are an unstoppable force. Speaking to students across campus, we developed a platform to emphasize the urgent needs of our community. This platform has infused the work of the Student Assembly this year, and we are so proud of the progress that has been made. The theme of TEDx represents the same change that we saw last spring, and we are inspired by the immediate action that our community is taking to address these challenges. We have a responsibility to shape the type of community that we want to be a part of, and the speakers this evening represent those who sought to take actionable change in their communities. We hope that the speakers tonight spark inspiration and hope. The time is now. Thank you for being here, and we are, we are now excited to share the official TEDx video with you. Welcome to something special. Welcome to TEDx. This TEDx event is part of a global conversation that takes place every day in every corner of the world. In schools, in theaters, in workplaces, even in prisons, people gather to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. More than 3,000 TEDx events are held every year in 170 countries. It's a remarkable thing. TEDx events are self-organized under a license from TED, a nonprofit organization devoted to discovering and sharing powerful ideas in the form of TED Talks. It's not TED itself, but your local TEDx team of volunteers that has done all the work to put on today's event, including booking all of the speakers. It's this team's ideas, dedication, and time that have made this possible. We really hope today's program sparks an exciting conversation. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you will take out. And now, on with the show. Before we jump into our speaker lineup, I want to ask everyone to think about the Wellness Center for a moment. With its recent construction and promotion over campus, I trust that most community members know about its resources devoted to love and care. Now, not to draw too much attention from our second year graduate student, Krista Schroth, but how do we use those means to actually improve what we think about ourselves? What is the story that we're trying to tell ourselves about us? Now, as having experience as a teacher and now taking her studies as seriously as any other twomp, please welcome Krista to tell us about Sandra and Story. All right, I know we just met, but I want you to close your eyes. I want you to take a moment and I want you to think of the busiest place you've ever been. Maybe it's a concert, maybe it's a big sporting event, or maybe it's an iconic landmark like the Eiffel Tower. Now, I want you to try and remember every person you saw that day, every person you passed by, and I want you to think about the fact that every single person you saw, every person you didn't see, has a story as complex and as intricate as yours. That realization or understanding is called Sonder. This idea that all around us invisibly is a network and a matrix of stories happening, whether or not we acknowledge it or recognize it, is a huge thought. Now, I want you to try something else with me. I need everyone in here to find a partner that is next to them. One of you is gonna be partner A, and one of you is gonna be partner B. In a moment, a question is gonna come up on the screen, and I want partner A to ask partner B the question. It's a simple question, and I just want you to answer it as quickly and as honestly as possible. Okay, are we ready? Okay. 
So take a second. For those of you who asked, how did that feel? For those of you who were asked, how did it feel? Yeah? So I have done this activity many, many times, and I get nearly the same response, no matter if it's hundreds of people or just a few people at a time. It's awkward, it's uncomfortable, it's embarrassing, it's intrusive. Both to ask and be asked that question is difficult. And even more so, to answer the question is almost never just a straightforward, positive, happy yes. It's usually a kinda, I'm, I'm working on it, I'm getting there. Um, and, and this goes to show that Loving ourselves is not an easy task. It's, it's not a destination, it's, it's a process. And so we have this idea now that each and every one of us has our own difficult story. Everyone in this room, everyone outside of it, this room, every minute of every day of every hour is living this big story. But despite how different we are and how different our stories are, we all end up in this nearly samely, same place of self-deficiency, this self-doubt. So with that, I want to tell you a story of stories. So I moved to Eastern North Carolina years ago to teach high school science. I was jazzed. I was ready to nurture the next class of Nobel Prize winning chemists. We were going to find the cure to cancer. We were going to be super cutie while we were doing it, and it was going to be a great time. Now, my enthusiasm and my excitement about igniting a passion in STEM never wavered, but I quickly realized that my students needed something a lot better and a lot more meaningful than Common Core aligned lesson plans. When I got there, I was met with defiance, apathy, sadness, anger, emotions I just, I could never have anticipated. Children are lovely and wonderful and kind. They're not mean and they're not hurtful. We become that way because of the things that happen to us through our lives and because of the way that our story unfolds. Um, one day in a particularly difficult class, I actually just had to stop my lesson plan, which is shocking because electronegativity is like so fun. So, <laughs> but besides the fact, we had to stop and I actually had to get everyone to bring their chairs together and get in a circle and we had a family team meeting because we were so at odds, I couldn't even get my lessons through. And I found that it actually worked. So slowly but surely, I started experimenting more. In my chemistry classes, we were doing mindfulness activities. We were meditating. Uh, we started doing thankful Thursdays, and we would write what we were grateful for on a post-it note, and we would put it up on a bulletin board. Um, I'm not telling you I am a miracle worker, I am not telling you that my students all like charged on in and were like, I'm super grateful. But I am saying that it did make an impact and I noticed a difference. This led me to the greatest experiment that we ever tried in Classroom 304, which is called the story of self. This is actually something I was assigned in my undergraduate time. And all it is is an assignment that gives you the opportunity to tell a story about how you have become the person you are. Um, in my assignment, I chose to paint canvases that each represented the events of my life and who I had become. Years later, I would bring these canvases to my own classroom and I would share them with my students. As a full-grown adult, I cried. Uh, I opened up and I shared about shame and heartache, depression, hopelessness, things I don't often share with people I'm close to. I shared these things, I was embarrassed, but these were the things that had made me the teacher that they had grown to love. As soon as I got done, I then said, now it's your turn. <laughs> Some students dove right in. They were so excited for the opportunity to be creative and for the opportunity not to be doing chemistry. <laughs> and some were annoyed. Some were frustrated. Some had no idea what this had to do with high school science. So being the adorably persistent person that I am, I just said, just give it a try. So a few days passed, and the day of the story of self-assignment, I took our big black shiny lab tables that you have in a science classroom, and I pushed them all together so that we'd have one big table so we could all sit together facing one another. 
As the students marched in, it was that same thing. There were some that were so excited, and I could see all the props they had brought, and others who were annoyed and angry and huffing and rolling their eyes. And so we began. Um, the first young woman who went shared a story with some pictures, Latila, just a nice story about her family. Um, the next two who went were actually twins, and they had a nice big visual timeline of all the events of their lives. The fourth young woman, Amani, who went shared a poem that ended with the line, in a city that will never mean as much to me since my best friend left it. She didn't open up on that, she didn't expand, but you could tell she was choked up and you could tell there was so much more there to that story, but we pushed on. Now the fifth student in line was a student named Wen and he was from China. Now, surprisingly, in eastern North Carolina, in a rural place where I saw more deer than adults in a week, there were not abundant sources for English language support. So we truly had spent the majority of the year just working together through his pocket translator and Google translator. So earlier in the week when he had come to me and he had asked, is it okay if I sing for my story of self? I was jazzed but I was also a little worried that maybe I was misunderstanding. But either way, I was just excited I had at least one person on my team that was excited to do it. So when it came one time, he pulled out a piece of paper and he read his story. It was a little choppy and he was a quiet spoken uh, student, so it was a little hard to understand. But then he put it away and he took out his phone and slid it out onto the big black lab table and he hit play and the music started coming out. And slowly but surely, he opened his mouth and he started singing. Y'all, I was transfixed. There was nothing in the room but when and I. And as he began to sing, his bravado grew and you could see his courage and I felt so excited and so happy. And then all of a sudden, a wave of fear came rushing in and I realized, oh, I'm the adult in the room. <laughs> And as much as I want to tell you that my students were all perfect angels and super mature, um, I would be lying to you. Some of them could barely get through Thankful Thursday without making snide remarks. And so my fear was that in my transfixed moment, I might have missed some students being disrespectful or on their phones or rolling their eyes or just some behavior that would, would not honor the bravery that Wynn was showing. So I took a big deep breath and I sat back ready for disappointment and it was anything but that. Every student was as transfixed as I was. And as soon as one song concluded, everyone started clapping. A bunch of the basketball boys jumped up and ran over to him. They were patting him on the back. It was the Super Bowl of like story of self and like high school science classes. So yeah, well, from that moment on, everything changed. Every story got deeper and richer. Children sobbed and they shook. They shared things that no child, let alone no adult, should ever know so much about. Students who never really ever even interacted were getting up and moving across this table to sit with others, just to hold them and to be with them. When we got done, the students could not stop asking and remarking, why don't we do this more? Why don't we do this type of activity in all of our classes. Now, one boy in particular said, Ms. Shroff, I gotta say something. Kid's a little sassy, so I didn't know what was coming, but I said, okay. And he actually turns to a boy across from him, one that he did not get along with particularly well, and he said, man, I gotta tell you something. I thought you were a real asshole. <laughs> then he like sheepishly looks over at me because he knew I didn't love when they cursed, and I just nod, and. He goes ahead and he says, hearing what you've been through, hearing the loss you've experienced, I get it now. I would be more pissed if I was you. I don't even understand how you come to school. His remarks were not isolated. This happened over and over again throughout the entire day. Now, if you remember the first four women who we started that activity with, they were so moved that they actually asked if they could come for the next period. And I said, as long as your teachers are okay with it and my second period of family is okay with it, by all means, join us. And so they checked and they were allowed and they came and I actually let them lead the beginning and the instructions. The four of them went, it was as if I had invited four new women that I had never met to the class. 
they told completely different versions of their story. They went deeper and they went richer and they, they exposed so much of their story that they had left out in the first telling. So when we got done with that round of pain and courage and tears, I couldn't help but ask the girls to explain what had just happened. I said to my second period family, the stories you just heard from these women are much different than what they told in their first period. And I said, why? Every one of them said, because of when. They said they saw what Wen's courage and bravery did, and they saw how it changed the trajectory of that day for every other student in that class. And they said they felt almost selfish for holding back and for not opening up. And if that they could do that for somebody else and give them that power, they wanted to. Many days have passed since that time, and my own canvases have changed. But the things I learned from my students and that experience are still with me. The first is that your story is only as powerful as you are willing to be vulnerable. Sometimes you have to step into the hard, you have to open up, and you have to share. Because when we do, we give others the power to do so. We give voice to those who may not have one. If it weren't for when, I don't actually know if I would be up here able to tell you this story. The second thing I learned is that Sometimes our stories lead to self-deprecation because of the other characters involved. Sometimes the characters are villains, the people in our life who feel like they're only there to bring us down. I beg you to remember that when you come across those assholes, <laughs> that sometimes they're the ones who are hurting the most. Hurt people hurt people. The second to last thing I'll leave you with that I learned from that day is that oftentimes we end up in places of doubt when we're comparing our story to other stories. You might see that girl on Instagram and her story is reading a lot like a romantic comedy, whereas yours might be looking a little bit more like a novel about the apocalypse. <laughs> it's okay. Your story does not have to stay in the same genre forever and you get multiple drafts. So just keep in mind, there's a reason that they say that comparison is the thief of joy. The last thing I'll leave you with is that I've realized through this experience and telling this story that the most important story we can actually talk about is the one that we're telling ourselves. Our brains are these big, beautiful computers. And the program that it runs is our self-talk. It's our inner dialogue about who we should be or could be, about what we have or about what we don't have. So I just urge you, when you're talking to yourself, pay attention. When you're thinking about the story that's going on inwardly, just listen. And when you find yourself telling yourself a story that isn't true, just try a little bit at a time to move that story and move that needle. Now, I want you to go back to the place that we all started with. I want you to think about all of those people. In that crowd is a Wen. There's a Latila, there's an Amani, the twins, there's me. You cannot know everything about every story. All you can know is that everyone around you, everyone in this room is living a story and we're doing the best that we can. Self-love and owning our story is really hard work, but it's work worth doing, and the time is now. Thank you. Now we're about to hear from a Boston Marathon runner, an Air Force contract maker, a Minecraft player, someone who finds integration, collaboration, and community a fundamental part of every environment that he enters. He has navigated a unique situation and applied this in a constructive manner to shape a new perspective. Now here to share that perspective, please help me in welcoming a graduate student at the college, Michael Davis, with Respectable to Be You.
Today, I'd like to tell you about my family. I was raised by my mom, Regina, and my grandmother, Sarah, and they taught me the importance of hard work, perseverance, and that I could accomplish anything through a sense of community. What is a community? A community is a group of friends, family, and loved ones who will support you, believe in you, no matter what you want to accomplish. They'll always be there to support you, no matter what you want to do, and they will always, they'll always love you, no matter, no matter what goes wrong, no matter what happens, and they'll pick you up whenever you fall. My grandmother taught me this in several ways. The first way was through her life. She was born in 1927, during the Great Depression, and she saw many things, including the Civil Rights Movement, the changes that happened with women's rights, and through her career, she showed me how one person can make a difference because my grandmother became the first progress woman at Naval Station Norfolk. She was the first woman to hold that job because the job title was Progress, Progress, Progress Men. And so she held the job, and so it was for, it was for a man. And you know, so this was something that she did, and it showed me that she was able to not only make a difference, but influence her coworkers. Her coworkers were very impressed with her work, her supervisor, and she just showed me all the things that she did throughout her federal service with the Navy. She also enforced chores. She was very serious about chores. Uh, on Saturday morning, I had to, we had these huge pine trees in our front and backyard. I had to pick up pine cones and sticks. And she would pay me a penny for each pine cone and stick I picked up. Uh, even though I'm legally blind, she didn't, you know, she didn't let me, you know, skip out on any chores. She said, you know, these will teach you hard work. They'll teach you how to save. And we would take the money that I, that I, that I got from chores and I was able to get my first savings account. And it taught me, you know, a work ethic, how to accomplish a task. She said, just because you have a disability doesn't mean you can't do something and that you can't reach your goal. My mom taught me as an educator, she is, still teaches, for, she, she taught and still teaches fourth graders, and she taught me how to read. I'm the poster boy for Hooked on Phonics Work for Me. <laughs> because I'm, I'm legally blind, so, you know, reading was very hard for me. I was the slowest reader in a lot of my classes, but my mom, being an educator, believed that education was a silver bullet. It's the key to solving any problem, any dispute. And she taught me that even if my classmates did not value what I had to offer, because I'm a slow reader, if they made fun of me, she always said it was their problem. It wasn't my problem. And this really helped me as I transitioned to school. Uh, this was taken when I was in first grade. And in elementary school, my peers did make fun of me. I started off when I was about, when I was about eight years old. I remember going to T-ball, and they would do, uh, you know, they had the T and the baseball, and I would try to hit the ball, and I would, you know, knock the T over. Several times, I've knocked the T over. I would, you know, swing back, and I was, you know, I would hit the ball sometimes, and the ball would fly way up in the air, and I thought, you know, I finally hit the ball, and the ball landed maybe like one inch from my right foot. <laughs> and my peers laughed at me. You know, they told me that I, that I sucked, that I was terrible, and that I, you know, shouldn't play anymore. And they didn't really want to play with me anymore. So, you know, I felt bad when things like that happened. I felt bad when they made fun of me for, uh, for being a slow reader. And this happened for years. Uh, my fifth grade teacher, I uh, finally noticed it, and she said, you know, you all are leaving Michael out of group assignments. You really won't play with him. You exclude him. You laugh at him because he's a slow reader, and Michael has a lot of things to contribute, and just because he reads slower than you, he understands things, and he has straight A's, unlike all of you. And so she called out my whole class when I was about 10, and I was very, 
I was very embarrassed, but also very happy in a way because she, she showed me the values that my family taught me. She showed me that hard work, perseverance, and community, you know, having those things, it really pays off. And this prepared me for middle school. Going into sixth grade, uh, my honors English teacher, she did not want to teach me because I'm legally blind. She told me that you don't belong in my class. Uh, you know, I'm not going to teach a blind student. She said that I should change my schedule. And it was very difficult, but uh, also the, the bullying got worse because in elementary school, you can sit with your class for lunch, but in middle school, you can form groups and sit anywhere else. And so many times I would go to sit with kids and they would say, oh, this seat is saved, you know. This seat is saved, you can't sit here or, you know. So I would sit in the cafeteria, you know, I would either try to sit in the cafeteria, but I couldn't. But then I would go to the library and just have lunch in the library. I would have, like, peanut butter and crackers in the library. And I just wasn't really able to sit in with my peers in the cafeteria. But, the, you know, these, these are horrible situations that happened. Um, you know, I can't change what happened. But we were able to work things out with my English teacher because my mom was really mad. And so she, <laughs> she said, you know, we're working this out now. <laughs> and so I was able to, you know, continue the class. And I got an A in her class. And I showed her the value that I could bring to her class and that I could keep up with the work if accommodations were made. And these skills of advocating for myself at an early age really helped me going on into my adulthood. I graduated from the University of Richmond with an accounting degree. And you know, I was looking for a job. And the thing that I found in looking for a job, it was difficult because of my disability, because of other things employers thought about people that are blind and vision impaired. But in that, I found community. I found the National Federation of the Blind, and I found the running community. And with the National Federation of the Blind, they are the largest group of uh, blind and vision impaired individuals in the country. And one of my favorite memories is when Dr. Fred Schroeder was speaking, when I was about 24 at a state convention. He said, it is respectable to be blind. That may not seem like much to you, but when he said it is respectable to be blind, that showed me that it was okay to be who I am. Because I can only be who I am. I can't be anyone else. I can't make you know, false pretenses. I can't do that. But when he said that, I said, you know, it doesn't matter about my disability. It's okay to be who I am. And in this group, I found a lot of support a lot of community support. And I met one individual, uh, Desmond Walker. I met Desmond when Desmond was in fourth grade. And he had just survived brain cancer. And his mom, Judy, who's an amazing mom, trying to do the right thing, you know. Desmond had, had cancer. He almost died. She was very scared. And I talked with her on the phone for quite a while because she didn't want to exploit Desmond's disability. I heard about his story through a church, through a local church. And I, you know, I contacted her and I said, on behalf of the National Federation of the Blind, you know, we can help Desmond to succeed, to be successful, because he went from being totally sighted to being totally blind. And she was nervous. She didn't know how, what Desmond needed. And I told her, I said, I said, I want the same things for Desmond that you want. I said, I want him to be successful. I want him to have what he needs. I want him to be able to be the best person that he can be and to do all that he can do. And I have all these resources that I did not have when I was Desmond's age. My mom had to fight for them. And I don't want you to have to fight for them. It doesn't make sense. I have the resources, and so she felt a lot calmer and a lot less scared, 
and we were able to navigate through and walk her through the process. She got Desmond resources almost immediately. And now he's a senior at my high school and the high school that I was bullied at a lot. And now Desmond wants to become a counselor for the blind. He wants to give back to his community the same way that I've given back to mine. I'd also like to talk about the running community because that was a big part of my early adulthood, and even now I'm still involved with Team Hoyt Virginia Beach and Ainsley's Angels of America. Two charities with one mission, pushing people with disabilities in marathons. This photo was taken in the 2018 Boston Marathon where I pushed Ashton McCormick. Ashton has autism. He also attends my high school. And I met him about seven years ago. And he's done a lot of changing since then because Ashton doesn't like crowds. He's not very social in terms of that, but he loves the running community and he loves being out there and he loves racing and he gets so excited when he's racing and he has benefited so much from this. And we were the first duo team that they ever had at Boston to do this where a blind runner or a disabled runner has pushed another disabled runner with a guide runner. So we were the first ones to do this, and it took five years. It took a lot of races, a lot of training, um, hundreds, of, hundreds of miles. I mean, just a lot of training. And a lot of emails, about 220 emails between myself and the Boston Athletic Association between, you know, to get this done. But, you know, it has really helped. Anyone else with a disability now that wants to do this can do this because they have a policy in place for it. A community can also be anything that you can imagine, anything that you can dream of. And through these communities, I have found a lot of, a lot of support. I'd also like to talk about this community, the gaming community. Because this has also been a part of, a huge part of my life. Uh, I'm a, I'm, I play a lot of video games. And this is something that I designed in Minecraft. Minecraft, if you don't know, is a game where you, you build different things. And for my whole life, people have asked me, as a blind person, how do you see a set of stairs? Well, on the right side, you'll see uh, basically black stairs, you know, not really distinguishable. And on the left side, you'll see a lot of color, a lot of distinguishing, fig distinguishing features. And the, the point that I'm trying to make is that I see stairs as the black stairs. I have to, every time I go down a set of stairs, that's how I see them. I have to figure out where they're located so that I don't fall down the stairs. And through this game, I'm able to show people how I'd like to see stairs, which is the left side. And so this is just one perspective where I can share you know, with people how I, from my perspective how I see things. And also with the Air Force, I currently work for the Air Force, and my manager asked me, they're doing a recruitment thing for uh, cybersecurity, and I manage cybersecurity contracts, so it ties in. And they're doing a gaming, uh, a, a March Madness Mortal Kombat gaming event <laughs> on Twitch. And so I'll be a part of that. I'll be streaming with that. That'll be really exciting. But the point that I'm trying to make is that whatever your perspective, your sense of community, it could be any community, the, the athletic community, the academic community, the gaming community, anything. Whatever you can uh, imagine, whatever you think you can achieve, you can achieve whatever you want to achieve through hard work, perseverance, and community. And finally, I'd like to leave you with a family story. On Christmas, my family would do talent shows. We would do uh, instruments, sometimes musical instruments, piano, not always playing instruments well, not always singing well, but we had a sense of love, community, and just respect for each other. And as Fred Schroeder said, it is respectable to be blind, but I think that it is respectable to be you. All of you have your own unique perspective that you can bring to solve problems, to create whatever you want to create. And only you know what those things are, but your community will lose out on all those things if you don't bring them 
to us, and you know, then we can all have the benefit of your perspective. So thank you very much, and it is respectable to be here. Have you ever graded your teacher? Like, really? <laughs> you made comments, edits, revisions, questioned their main argument, <laughs> and critiqued their call to action? It's not that fun. <laughs> it's pretty stress-inducing, especially when it comes to your speech professor's speech. <laughs> I can tell you last semester when I sat in the back of Professor Michelle Bates King's Fundamentals of Oral Communication class. I wasn't thinking about the authority I had in telling a professor of 20 plus years with a PhD what to do. Despite my discomfort, this champion of rhetoric, and you'll soon learn, eSports, made my job a breeze. Thank you, Professor King, for making everything so amazing and allowing me to bolster you into speaking tonight. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor King with Time to Get in the Game. When ancient civilizations are unearthed, mysteries are revealed about its people, what they did, how they survived, and who they were as social beings. As archaeologists discover artifacts, they gain insight into a culture's values, beliefs, and attitudes. Of the many artifacts uncovered, one in particular allows researchers to reflect on the society's trials, trends, and tribulations games. If the ludological presupposition thought to be positive by Greek philosopher Plato is true, then we can learn more about a person in one hour of play than in a year of conversation. Because play is embedded in human psychology, and games are inherently a part of our origin. They are a means of sustaining social connectivity. According to Dutch theorist Johan Hutzinga, the expression of play satisfies all kinds of communal ideals and creates common bonds among its people. And ultimately, play is a necessary condition of a culture. And that gaming culture exists right here, right now, in dorm rooms and classrooms and living rooms across the globe through eSports which is this world of competitive gameplay. And it requires a tremendous amount of critical thinking, collaboration, communication, and creativity. So what was once thought of as a casual gaming society is now a legitimate academic and applied initiative commanding an official presence on our campus and in our institutions of higher learning. The time is now to get in the game. So we're going to power up by taking a journey through the timeline of our discovery of eSports, examine the world of eSports, and then express our desire for our students to imagine their future. So let's set the scene as we take a journey through the timeline of our discovery of eSports. And I say our discovery because here at William & Mary, we have an innovative program that inspires faculty to collaborate on strategies to enhance student learning through the University in Teaching, Teaching and Learning Project. And our team decided to collaborate on play, games, gamification, and game-based learning. And through our quest, the path kept bringing us back to eSports. It was so huge that we decided to focus completely on eSports. So to see if what we found had momentum, we first launched a student interest survey. 
And we hit the ground running. We attended the Student Activity Club Fair in August 2019 with hundreds of incoming freshmen. And then my son Andrew and I, we blanketed the campus with eSports flyers with QR codes and a link to our survey. And we received an overwhelmingly positive response with more than 300 students. And from that, the qualitative data we gathered, we, we formed a focus group which brought together different cultures and majors and just, just gender, just different people because they all had a passion for esports and a desire to build a gaming community. So no matter their physical attributes or their native language or their economic status, esports levels the playing field. Our students spoke and we listened. Our team, we immersed ourselves even deeper into learning as much as possible. We attended an information technology conference, the NACE, National Association of Collegiate Esports Conference, and even an esports summit to educate ourselves as much as possible so that we can provide our students with the best esports experience. The Flat Hat, our student run newspaper, deemed it worthy enough to publish an article in April 2019 that stated, William and Mary needs to embrace the nationwide esports trend. That article reinforced everything that we were learning, and it showed how colleges would benefit and thrive with an esports program. So the journey through the timeline helped us to answer our questions, but what came next was a bigger challenge. Those inquisitive and skeptical conversations with questions like, what exactly is esports? You mean I can major in playing video games? Wait, wait, wait. I can have a career in gaming? Yes, yes, yes. Esports is simply organized competitive video gaming where teams come together and compete in tournaments, and fans, they can watch in live arena settings or stream online. Now, admittedly, many may have the stereotype of gamers living in their parents' basements, consuming energy drinks all day, staying up all hours of the night, and well, frankly, they're socially awkward because they play with people online and are not part of the real world, right? Well, thankfully, author Jane McGonigal in her book, Reality is Broken, dissects the true value of gaming as the environment that creates ambient sociability. It's, it's the expression of playing alone together. I mean, what better way to bring people out of their parents' basement than to tap into their shared historical framework of gameplay and put it into an organized setting with trained professionals so we can address some concerns such as violence in video game, physical and mental wellness of our players, toxic environments through discriminatory language, or even addiction. Because the phenomenon of esports will happen, whether we get in the game or stand on the sidelines. And esports is influencing culture today. If you were to Google LOL right now, you might think it would come up as laughing out loud. Actually, the top hit is the popular game League of Legends, along with other games like Over, uh, Overwatch, Fortnite, 2K, Rocket League. So with Fortnite, there was a 16-year-old who won $3 million for first place. So the growth of eSports is exponential, and it's becoming mainstream. So whether we embrace it as an academic way or the student involvement, the thing to remember is it's now time to value student engagement and participation. So our timeline through the journey of understanding eSports has ultimately landed us on the expression and helping students to imagine their future. Being in the classroom is an absolute privilege for me. And I brag that I never work a day in my life because I get to hang out with some amazing students. I mean, you guys really are cool. Okay. Uh, I get to learn about your interests and your research, and in my class, you learn how to communicate those brilliant ideas. But I want to ask you, why did you come to William & Mary? 
Was it for the stellar academics, the beautiful campus, the opportunity, the diversity? Did you know that William & Mary boasts more than 450 student clubs and organizations? We have everything from the Cheese Club, Anime, Syndicate, to Equality Alliance, Essence, Women of Color, and Bangra. We are truly a vibrant and inclusive community. And we have a saying that those who come here belong here. So whether you play video games or if you will ever participate in esports or not, I want you to consider your fellow classmate, Justin, who shared with me that gaming saved his life. After graduating high school, he didn't know what he was going to do. He didn't have a purpose or direction until he found an esports community. Or Alyssa, who said she learned to read because every time she played Zelda, her parents made her follow the storyline. Or my favorite, Sam, who reserves every Tuesday to game online with his dad back home in New Jersey. Students want it so badly here that I have seen them physically lug their own computers up to Blow Hall so they can compete with each other on a weekly basis. And educators, we know that extracurricular participation will only increase academic success. We imagine a day that we can enter, have interdisciplinary courses with eSports through psychology, music, computer science, sports analytics, broadcasting, hospitality. So whether we do it for the revenue that eSports will bring the college or the academic application or the national recognition of an eSports league, right, the time is now to support our tribe who are here today. The idea of play and gaming is alive and well among our students. And video games are no longer seen as a shameful, silly activity that is just a waste of time. Let us meet our students where their passions are and guide them into an education through a shared historical framework of play within the growing world of eSports. So this afternoon, we've taken a journey through our timeline we understand what eSports is, what it can do and bring to colleges, and how students can imagine their future. So let's, let's encourage future tribe scholars coming to William & Mary for our tradition to stay for their future. It's time to play the long game and level up. Game on. Thank you. Last summer, I walked 200 miles. I'm not gonna lie, I pretty much felt like an entire badass when I waltzed up, or limped up, to the Cathedral of St. James in Santiago de Compostela. However, my excitement could have been easily cut short if my arrival had been met by our next speaker, Professor George Grenia. You see, Grenia has logged over 4,000 miles of pilgrimage by foot, bike, and other steed. The founder for the Institute of International Pilgrimage Studies at William and Mary, and a recipient of the Compostela Prize in Preservation of European Culture, Grenia has at least one leg up on me in using hiking as an instrument to find higher meaning. We all know that Greenie obviously has more passion and education in themes of pilgrimage than I, so please join me in welcoming Professor Emeritus George Greenia with Modern Pilgrimage and the Quest in the Guest. Ten years ago, I met a man crying by a pile of rocks. I had already decided that I disapproved of him. <laughs> we had both undertaken a pilgrimage voluntarily to the shrine, well, on the Camino de Santiago, to the shrine of St. James. In the ninth century, it was reported that the tomb of the apostle St. James had been discovered in Northwest Spain. And for over a thousand years now, 
Pilgrims, pilgrims have been making their way to that shrine in faith, expectation, and wonder. Gosh, it hasn't always been that way. Well, nowadays, we're virtually indistinguishable on the trail. We all wear the same sort of trail shoes, Nikes or New Balance. We all have the same sort of hats from Columbia or Tilly. Uh, wind, <clears throat> windbreakers are from North Face. There's a cheap pair of flip-flops tied to your backpack that says Osprey or Gregory or Quechua if you're German. In the distance, it's even hard to tell gender in the unisex uniform of the walking pilgrim. That stranger who I saw crying and I would have insisted that we were equals. Gosh, it hasn't always been that way. Centuries ago, God, centuries ago, pilgrims only had one pair of clothes and it had to last them the round trip, not the choices of now. Uh, <clears throat> there are differences, however, even on the Camino de Santiago. Long distance walkers commit themselves to a journey that's 500 miles or further and they wear their weathered look with pride. They look down on the short distance walkers who do the minimum 65 miles or so to get their certificate from the cathedral. All the walkers look down on the bikers. <laughs> and this guy was a cyclist. I had started over 300 miles earlier and on foot. And yet, he was a pilgrim like me, and that should have been enough for me to indulge him without seeing him cry. I was failing to see the quest in the guest. William and Mary has the world's only institute for pilgrimage studies. And, aw shucks, I'm the founder. We study pilgrimage in every time, territory, and tradition. There are over 25 faculty on this campus that look and examine and research why and how people undertake pilgrimage and what moves them. <coughs> what are the motivations? What drives them? What leads them on? Yes. We study traditional pilgrimage to medieval shrine sites, but also pilgrimage to modern sites like Rome and Jerusalem and Mecca. We look at religious tourism, but we also look at patriotic pilgrimage. If you visit Ground Zero in New York or the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., or Colonial Williamsburg, aren't you on a pilgrimage too? Aren't you on a search for transcendent values and to connect with the people who represent those values, that embody those values? Doesn't that count as a pilgrimage too? And what about the folks who offer hospitality? The people who welcome and shelter and give a listening ear and compassion to travelers on a sacred journey. Aren't they beneficiaries as well? when they listen for the quest in the guest. Every year, tens of millions of Americans undertake a journey for reasons of transcendent spirituality, of powerful meaning, of emotional contact that are valuable to them and many times for those around them. Nowadays, with the possibility for new mobilities and new forms of transportation, almost everyone around the planet who has wanted to make a pilgrimage can, either to a shrine site in a neighboring village or to a mountaintop in a foreign country. That too is pilgrimage, and over 
440 million people on this planet make such a journey every year. I met that guy the previous night in a pilgrim shelter. We had spent the night there, and me, with my relentless good cheer, was bouncing around, pleasantries, asking questions. How did it go for you? This guy had a hefty laptop and was blogging and blogging, resistant to any human approach. At some point, I decided he didn't need us. And frankly, I, I didn't need him. Who goes on pilgrimage? Virtually everyone. And despite its religious overtones, pilgrimage has always been a poor vehicle for indoctrination. It's not a good way to impose dogma. Why? Because walking pilgrims sharing a journey entertain themselves. They talk to each other. They air their concerns and burdens and fears. And their values gradually converge. They tell stories. They tell jokes. They reveal secrets to strangers. Who goes on pilgrimage these days on the Camino de Santiago? Everything from industrial strength Catholics to mainline <laughs> denominations to bearers of aromas, crystals, and grudges against their former churches. <laughs> there are even people who are pissed at God for not existing. And shouldn't we accept them all as pilgrims? When I approached that man and I couldn't get a response, frankly, he irritated me. Why couldn't he join in the conversations of our entire group gathered in that pilgrim's refuge? Why couldn't he too share our pleasantries about the break in the weather, about the long uphill climb, about the poor food choices here in the highlands? He just kept blogging and blogging. Look, he was middle-aged like me. A guy, uh, English rather than American, perhaps a professional to judge from his expensive gear. How could he resist? My charm? <laughs> How could he resist the neediness of many of those around us? It was worse. He was an Anglican priest, and I am a former Franciscan brother, still in love with my faith tradition and my faith community. Why couldn't we leap onto common ground? I got my answer by a pile of stones. The topographical high point of the Camino de Santiago stands just under 5,000 feet in elevation. For over 2,000 years, those who passed by and cleared the summit as a rite of passage would take a stone and throw it off the trail onto a heap. That heap is now yards high and yards wide. The old Roman road is gone. So is the medieval cart path. There's a small, rough-hewn, asphalt country road that snakes past this huge pile of stones, now with a single iron cross on top. Every summer, many bulldozers show up to push the loose stones back onto the pile and off the roadway. Christians in the Middle Ages reinterpreted the gesture and made it their own. They carried a stone, often from their home, all the way to this high point at the Iron Cross. It symbolized their sins and their burdens. And throwing it away, placing it at the foot of a cross, allowed them to complete their journey lighter and relieved. 
This time, when I approached that man, crying by a pile of rocks, I sat down next to him. The bicycle was parked 100 yards away, the laptop buried in the panniers. He revealed to me that his only son, at age 22, had died of cancer, never having made the Camino de Santiago as he had hoped. This priest's par parishioners consoled him as best they could. And then they commissioned him in his son's name, in their names, to do the Camino de Santiago for them. And so he carried that online community with him for every mile that he biked through England and then France and now Spain. And in some pilgrim shelter, he would settle in and open up his laptop and write to them, sharing every mile of sorrow and healing. I sat next to him, and finally, we did bridge communities. He joined my community of walkers, and in a small way, I joined his community of online grief and healing. As church attendance in Western society has gone down, pilgrimage has gone up. It's ballooned, it's exploded. Over 440 million people a year are in motion, seeking transcendence, seeking connection with values that they hold, not just as spiritual beings, but perhaps even as citizens. In the United States, a place where we don't talk about pilgrimage because it seems so odd and not secular, we seek our historic identity in Civil War battle sites, along the Trail of Tears, in the newly reimagined Underground Railroad. Aren't we, too, on pilgrimage? The Institute for Pilgrimage Studies, here at William & Mary, every year, shows and exercise its leadership in travel for transformation. We have a national and now international reputation, known and respected in Canada, in Ireland, in Scotland, in England, in Norway, Sweden, and Finland, in the Netherlands, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, and Portugal, in Serbia and Mexico, on to Israel, India, Indonesia, the Philippines. Every year, we host a symposium on pilgrimage studies here at William & Mary, and scholars from across the world come to speak to each other and ask each other the big question. And the big question is this. How do we access, honor, and preserve in its dignity the shrine sites and sites of communal memory to which we think it's important to make a pilgrimage? How do we forestall the disnification of the sacred? I get pushed back. This is a state university after all. What are we doing with the Institute for Pilgrimage Studies? On the contrary, as an institution without religious ties, with no filter in place, we are the common ground the table that welcomes everyone to conversations about spirituality, whether you feel fully affiliated with a religious tradition or adrift or still seeking or willing to listen to others. We live in an age of resentment for American military might across the planet and commercialization. We can offer a model now about respect for spirituality in a common conversation. And if you're really lucky, someday you will sit down by a pile of stones with a stranger and cry. Thank you.
As we wrap up our discussion on religion, we'll be switching gears to another topic. In a heated climate surrounding hashtag Me Too, as well as other movements arising from a socially combative nature towards women, Matthew Boyer, a junior at the college, is here to share his story on gender inequality and the case for collegiate accountability. Very quickly, we do want our audience members to know that there will be momentary references to rape and violence in this dialogue. As a government and public policy double major, as well as having moved throughout the world 11 times, Matthew Boyer knows a thing or two about the people that make up the systems in which he engages. So please help me give a warm welcome to Matt Boyer. This story begins with a woman named Anne Buff. She's a captain in the United States Public Health Service. She's a medical doctor by training. And she's proudly served this country for 20 plus years. This woman is my mother. Now as an epidemiologist for the Center for Disease Control, my mother has run disease prevention programs across the world taking on the likes of malaria, polio, and tuberculosis. I don't know how many people her work has impacted, but what I do know is that the world is a better place with her in it. My mom tells this story when we were living in Egypt, and yes, I know I said living in Egypt casually, but that's the reality when your mom's job is fighting diseases. So she was headed into a meeting with the CDC team there and they went into this conference room and they were sitting at this long table. And at the head of the table sat her boss, an older Egyptian man. And so right before they were about to get started, her boss, Dr. Ali, said to her, Dr. Buff, you'll be taking the minutes. And my mom replied, Dr. Ali, you have a full-time secretary who you hired for that purpose. If you'd like us to have the minutes for the meeting, you can have your secretary take them. And as my mom describes it, there was this dead silence in the room, and she and Dr. Ali locked eyes for what seemed an eternity. Suffice to say, my mother did not take the minutes for this meeting. But I share the story as it is one that embodies a deeper and more realistic truth about our world, and that is that the struggle for men to treat women and for men to treat anyone not a man as their equal continues, and that this was never a women's problem, but rather a man's. When I think about this question of equality, and that which results because we haven't yet achieved it, I envision it a little like this. Have men been taught how to treat women, and have men been taught about the systemic biases that women encounter every day? And so if the answer is no to either of these questions, then we find ourselves reflecting upon the world in which we live. Men talking over women. Men brushing women's opinions off. Men keeping women from positions of leadership. Men not paying women the same. Men mistreating women, men harassing women, men sexually assaulting women, men raping women. The world in which we live. A lot of the times we leave our men to pick up on the soft norms of society instead of sitting them down and telling them to their face how it is that they should treat women and what it is that women go through. The other day, I was walking between class, and I hear the words, it's 2020. Why are men such trash? <laughs> Good question. It's 2020. This is a phrase I generally hear when people are fed up with the status quo of some kind. And men are trash. This is a phrase I generally hear when women are commiserating so over some experience where men and trash and the same sentence is understandable. However, what grounded this comment in my mind was not that but a week earlier I had had two distinct conversations with college women, both of whom are really good friends of mine, about how they had been mistreated by college men. So at the end of one of these conversations, my friend looks at me and she says, Matt, I don't know who it falls to to teach men how they should treat women but what I do know is that we can't just expect individual men to change. And so in the days that followed, all I could help but to hear was her voice saying, we can't just expect 
individual men to change. Now, I'm going to pivot slightly, but I want you to stay with me. In 2017, the Harvard Business Review conducted this fascinating study. The premise of the study was that they were trying to determine whether gender differences in behavior drive gender differences in outcomes at this large multinational firm. So in the study, they gave 100 individuals in the company sociometric badges, able to record communication patterns, proximity to other badges, and the metadata of speech. So who talks with whom, where people communicate, and who dominates these conversations. And then Harvard's team got together and they formed a few hypotheses about why there were different rates of promotion between men and women. And they came up with, well, maybe women had fewer mentors, less face time with managers, or were not as proactive as men in talking to senior leadership. But what they ended up finding was that none of their hypotheses were true. The final analysis suggested that the actual difference in promotion rates between men and women at this company was due not to women's behavior, but rather to how they were treated by the men who could promote them. Bias, a word used to describe when two groups of people act identically but are treated differently, their answer was bias. And so why is it that I share my friend's experience with college men and this Harvard study? Well, because it is those college men that go on to perpetuate a world that leaves my friend wondering how men become good men. Here, I stand in front of you, a student in college, an extremely profound setting, a time in which we learn interior and exterior to the walls of our lectures, a last stop before we head out into the world ready to make it our own. The time is now. I dream of a world where our colleges become centers of social innovation and in how they challenge their men to the practice of gender equity each and every day. For you see, if we set expectations now, then we change culture for all time forward. Hear me out. Increasingly, colleges are enrolling freshmen prior to their arrival on campus in online modules meant to inform on drinking and sexual violence. And while this is of value, why not also educate on the practice of gender equitable behavior from the outset of a college career? Because if you're never told what it is that you should be, then your actions will always fall short of expectations. And we would be remiss if we left existing collegial institutions untouched. Let us mandate that college coaches lead series of ongoing discussions on every male sports team in this country to foster in their team and among their individual men an expectation for how all women are to be treated. I was a Division I athlete, and I'll tell you that it isn't enough simply to tell men not to take advantage of women. That bar is too low. And in this same vein, let us empower our Greek life and mandate that to hold a Panhellenic charter, that fraternities be actively engaged in how discussions of gender equitable behavior becomes a norm and not some affront to the boys. Because being told you shouldn't take a woman home when she can't walk, that's not it either. And if you hear in your minds it's these things we already do, well then I challenge. Why is it? that women describe athlete and fraternity parties as lion dens? Why is it that women go out in groups fearful to go out on their own? Why is it that every woman has some story of getting treated like shit? When did we de allow these realities to become our normality? I fear we're a whole lot better. It would also seem relevant to say that our college faculties need to do a better job resembling their student bodies, because if it is equal opportunities they preach, it is equal opportunities they should practice. And to ensure from here on out and every day forward that our colleges remain committed to their women, let us convene bodies made up of every walk of life on campus for the sole purpose of deliberating what traditional institution need topple next. Change becomes imminent when accountability comes knocking. To William and Mary and every college in this country, commit yourselves to revolutionizing what has long been an unequal status quo.
and realize that while the solutions are many, you hold in your hands an awesome opportunity to educate the future of tomorrow in a way that reaches beyond that which it has ever been in the past. When I think about these things, I think about my mother. And I think about her strength as she challenged Dr. Ali to see her as equal. But that's just it, isn't it? She shouldn't have to. Women shouldn't have to. To colleges and their men, the time is now. Gender equality takes us to. Thank you. How do you top a theme like shortcomings of men to a group of college students? At the end of the day, it isn't about topping or one-upping, but applying the concepts that we've learned here tonight into our everyday lives. With that in mind, I'm thrilled to announce our final speaker, a junior at the college majoring in kinesiology and health sciences with a concentration in public health, Mariha Junaid. In the power of vulnerability, Mariha prepares to share experiences about the intersectionality of her identity and how that influences not only her mental health, but overall well-being. Now, without further ado, please help me welcome Mariha. In high school, I spent my weekends perfecting the craft of speech and debate. I dedicated what precious little extra time I had to learn how to communicate my thoughts clearly and effectively. After four years of this, I thought I had a pretty good idea of how to express myself. But one day in group therapy, one of my fellow members looked me in the eye and said, Mariha, you share with us, but it feels like you only share what you think we want to hear. Well, there goes four years of speech and debate tournaments. <laughs> she wasn't wrong though. I had learned how to project an image of myself, but the real me was hidden inside a shell, almost like I lived my life like a turtle. I had grown to figure out how to clearly express myself through this shell, but I was afraid of poking my head out. I was afraid of vulnerability. I was afraid to look inward and see who was really inside this shell. It took me a long time to realize that I was doing myself a disservice. It took me a long time to realize there is a real big question here. Why? Why is vulnerability and being vulnerable with the people that you trust and especially yourself considered so dangerous? I held this mentality that vulnerability was something that should be feared. I allowed myself to feel vulnerabil fear vulnerability to the extent that I ended up having generalized depression and anxiety. I held this mentality for majority of my life that vulnerability in our world is a moot endeavor, that we are in a world that is constantly full of hardships. It feels like everywhere we go, we have to be strong. That vulnerability should not be in our personal dictionary. But I was wrong. It wasn't until my diagnosis of generalized depression and anxiety that I realized that I had to reflect on what my emotions meant. I had to reflect on the importance that my emotions carry and realize that they are not a burden. I had to remind myself that I have internal emotional instincts that are so important and there's a reason that I have them. 
So, tonight, let's embrace our vulnerability. First, we will learn to acknowledge our emotions and the power they carry. Next, we will learn to accept that our emotions are not a burden, but rather they are the most important part of who we are. Finally, we will learn to, ex we will learn to appreciate our inner voice. Looking back, I had been growing that so-called turtle shell for a really long time. Like many Muslim Americans, I grew up in the, under the inescapable shadow of 9-11, the shadow that had such a constant presence in my life that I almost kind of chose to ignore it. But still, to shield myself from it, I decided that I was going to be impervious to the Islamophobia, bigotry, and racism that exists at the heart of our society. I decided that I was going to be the strong Muslim woman that I did not see on the TV. I started wearing the hijab, I began championing local community causes, and I tried to be a leader in my community as well. While these things benefited myself and my community, they also grew to become part of the shell that I thought was protecting me from the daily stigma and racism that just exists in our society. But I was fooling myself. This shell was not my so-called armor, but rather it was my Achilles heel. I was choosing to ignore the wounds that society was inflicting upon me. And I wasn't alone in my misperception. Several psychological studies from the past two decades have indicated um, untreated PTSD and anxiety in Muslim Americans. In her case study, Muslim Americans, the complex identity after 9-11. Sociology professor from Temple University, Michelle Bing writes, immigrants to the United States are forced to let go of their identity and their culture to assimilation. But at the same time, these immigrants and their children try to hold on to their ethnic culture to preserve their traditions and identity. In this constant tug of war, it feels so much easier to just lay down your weapons and stay in the realm of the in-between. This lack of concrete identity leads to an increased risk of PTSD and anxiety, as noted in several 2009 case studies on Muslim Americans and mental illness risk factors. But along with this predisposition to mental illness, the stigma around mental health creates a culture of, I'm fine. I'm fine is a cover-up. I'm fine is knowing that something's not fine, but still talking about it would just manifest its effects. I'm fine was not going to stop the impact that depression and anxiety had on my life. My pain was real. My pain was affecting my health, my education, and my quality of life. But why could I not open up and be vulnerable with myself about these feelings? Why was I so afraid to poke my head outside of my shell? What was stopping me from acknowledging these feelings and productively acting on them? Emotional self-disclosure is the ability of an individual to acknowledge their emotions and ac respond accordingly. In a 2009 American Psychiatric Association study, it was found that individuals with a lack of emotional self-disclosure also seem to have heightened symptoms of depression and anxiety. This means that people with depression and anxiety chose not to acknowledge their emotions because, come on, you have depression and anxiety. The pain that you're going to be feeling is something that you don't know how to act on. But emotional self-disclosure is an act of vulnerability. In order to be vulnerable with yourself, you have to learn that your emotions are not a burden. You have to learn to accept your emotions because your emotions are their motivator, your motivators. They add intention to your action. They make you who you are. So now we've acknowledged our emotions. So let's look at accepting our emotions. 
Raise your hand if you've recently had a conversation with someone that you trust about your deep concerns or your feelings. Now, keep your hand raised if you apologized at the conclusion of this conversation for sharing those feelings. I think I still see everyone's hands up. Why? Why did we apologize for sharing who we are with someone that we trust and love? Why do we apologize? When do we apologize? We apologize when we're giving someone a burden. We apologize when we give someone an inconvenience. We apologize when we're making a mistake. When I would try to talk to my therapist, my friends, my family, my parents, I would feel a 30-pound weight on my chest and a block in my throat. Being vulnerable meant that the Islamophobia, racism, and bigotry that I fought so hard to deny did in fact have an impact on me. Being vulnerable felt like a grave mistake. It wasn't until I spent time in group therapy that I learned that it wasn't the actions that were causing my guilt, but rather the act of being myself. Meaning that being vulnerable wasn't the guilty, wasn't the cause of my guilty verdict, but rather just being me. Okay, so what does that mean when you are hurting and you desperately need help? That means that you have to acknowledge and accept that what you are sharing with those that you love is not going to hurt them. It's not going to burden them. You're not inconveniencing them. Group therapy helped me learn that I was choosing not to acknowledge and accept my emotions because I was the burden in my eyes. But expressing myself is not a mistake. Expressing my emotions should not be ever considered a mistake, and it should not ever be considered a burden. My emotions are a gift. They're a gift from the purest part of my soul. They're the greatest thing that I could ever share with anyone. Learning this broke that shell. It freed me. It gave me the chance to connect with my loved ones and my friends. But most importantly, it gave me the chance to connect with myself. Now that we've learned to accept and acknowledge our emotions, let's move on to learning how to appreciate them. I have this little inner voice, and I think most of us all do. Uh, can we all say hi to that inner voice real quick? <laughs> But you all know who I'm talking about, right? You know that one voice that like wakes you up at 2 a.m. in the morning and then reminds you of the most embarrassing things that happened in seventh grade? <laughs> Half the time you have a midterm the next morning, too. So like, we're really mean to this voice, right? We beat it up for saying too much. We beat it up for not saying enough and then everything in between. But this inner voice is really, really important to who we are. This inner voice is who we are. It's that person inside the shell that I was choosing not to look at. I was choosing to ignore and refuse its presence. There's this great quote from um, this book. I'm sure you may have heard of it. Call me by your name. Um, Andre Osman conveys this message that being vulnerable and opening up about your feelings is the greatest thing that you could ever do. He says, we rip out so much of ourselves to not feel anything. We rip, up so, we rip out so much of ourselves to not feel anything that we go bankrupt by the age of 30 so that we have less to offer each time we start with someone new, but to feel nothing so as not to feel anything. What a waste. Why are we wasting this gift of emotion? Why are we wasting the ability to connect with others and connect with ourselves? This is where your inner voice comes back in. It's time to reconcile with that inner voice. It's time 
to say thank you. Thank you for everything that you do. Thank you for giving us that gut feeling when we know we're not being treated equally. Thank you for telling us we do have a crush on that guy and we do want to talk to them. Thank you for being honest, for trying to tell us what we are truly feeling when we're trying so hard to deny it. Breaking out of that shell and accepting that inner voice, it feels like a lot. It kind of feels like I'm asking you to run out to the world and share all of your deepest, darkest secrets and your fears and aspirations. And in a way, I am. But the world I'm asking you to express all of that to is you. I'm asking you to be vulnerable with yourself so that in turn, you will also be vulnerable with your friends and your family. I cannot even fathom how much joy I denied myself by denying this voice and this emotion that I felt for so long. I've been alive for 20 years. So 19 years of choosing to live in a shell. And let me tell you, 10 out of 10, I recommend getting out of that shell. <laughs> For so long, I lived my life like a lizard. Not like a lizard, as a turtle. For so long, I lived my life as a turtle. <laughs> Hold on, wait with me. I lived my life like a turtle. I chose to stay in that shell. I chose to never free myself from that shell. But it was a lie. I was supposed to live like a lizard. <laughs> I was supposed to live my life in the open with my strong scales protecting me. I had told myself for so long that I needed to be in that shell because my scales were not strong enough and my scales were not going to protect me, but I didn't need that protection. I was denying myself so much. I was denying myself a lot. But tonight, let's embrace our vulnerability. Let's learn to acknowledge our emotions. Let's learn to accept the great gifts that they are. Because living life like a turtle with a bulky shell holds us back from experiencing so much. Instead, let's brace the strong scales of a lizard and live our life free of this shell. Appreciating, accepting, and acknowledging. It is not a change that happens overnight. This is not a linear process, it's a cyclical one. And I'm so sorry to say that. But there's so much joy in this journey. There's so much joy. I am just starting my journey. Writing this talk was a part of it. Writing this talk made me acknowledge everything I've been through. It made me accept every been, everything I've been through. And now I'm appreciating it in front of all of you. To share your truth is honestly an awe-inspiring feeling, and I wish it upon every single one of you in this room. So, the time is now. The time is now to embrace and accept, acknowledge, and appreciate our vulnerability and our emotions. The time is now to leave our shell and start that transition from turtle to lizard because to feel nothing so as not to feel anything. What a waste. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. The time is now to talk about sustainability, self-love, 
community, gaming, pilgrimage, vulnerability, gender equality. The time is now to make a difference. We hope that tonight this event inspire you to talk about those topics and act. It's time to make a difference. We would like to invite our committee, the TEDx committee, to the stage. Without this team, this event would not be possible. They've been volunteering for the last seven months, their time, their passions, and their skills to make this event happen. So please join me in a applause for this team. We would also like to say thank you very much to our wonderful volunteers and the audio and visual team. Can you guys please stand up? <laughs> thank you to the volunteers and to the EV team. You guys made this happen. Thank you very much. We'd also like to give a special shout out to our advisor, Ann Arsenault. We appreciate your commitment to the event, your advice. And we hope you enjoy your newly free Thursday nights. And lastly, we'd like to thank our generous sponsors that we could not have done this without, uh, including the Vice President's Office, the Office for Student Leadership Development, Student Assembly, and Velocity Urgent Care Williamsburg. They offer a 20% off discount to students at their Williamsburg location, and there is a free trolley. So check that out. Um, we'd like for you to join. Oh, yeah, give us a round of applause. We hope you all join us in the reception upstairs after this event to talk about what you've heard here today and also for free pizza. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's right up these stairs and out those doors in Tidewater. Um, and lastly, we would like to thank you guys for being here and spending your Friday nights with us. We hope you look forward to TEDx William & Mary 2021 and we hope you have a great night and let's give one last round of applause for our speakers. Thank you.